All right, so now that the 96th Academy Awards have concluded, I can give you my top 10 list of what I think were the best and the worst Oscar nominations of 2023. What do I think the Academy got 100% correct? And what do I think they got really, really wrong? Hi, it's Brian. Welcome to the Awards Contender. And in today's video, I am giving you my top five best and top five worst Oscar nominations of 2023. Now, like in some of the other videos I've made on this topic for the years 2020, 2021, and 2022, I have three rules. The first rule is I cannot talk about a film or a performance that went on to win the Oscar. So, shocker, I'm not going to be talking about Emma Stone in this video. Rule number two is that I can only talk about a category once, and rule number three is that I can only mention a movie once. And for each of my worst picks, I'll give you the movie I would replace it with. Are you ready? Here we go. The number five worst Oscar nomination of 2023 is Best Animated Feature, Elemental. So I had heard mixed things about Elemental. Some people liked it, some people really hated it, and I didn't see it in the theater. I waited until it arrived on Disney+. And I'm a big Pixar fan, even though some of their films of the last few years have kind of underwhelmed. I mean, going back to their run in the 90s and 2000s, for a while there, Pixar was putting out one masterpiece after another. I mean, I would say the run from Toy Story in 1995 to Toy Story 3 in 2010 is an all-timer. I mean, there is not one bad film in that lineup. I guess you could say Cars from 2006. But compared to Cars 2 and Cars 3, Cars 1 is looking pretty good. And then even in recent years, there have been some standouts. I love Luca from 2021. That made my top five favorite films of the year list. But yeah, their last two films have not been very good. Lightyear, I barely even finished. I was just not into that one at all. And then even though I did respond to the animation in Elemental, I thought it looked really great. The story itself and the main characters never drew me in. I just found myself watching Elemental from afar. It didn't have the emotion Pixar movies usually have, and it felt very familiar. Like all of the Pixar storytelling tropes, it's just so obvious in Elemental, and at the end of the day, I just didn't find it that entertaining of a movie. I did think this was a step down for Pixar, and in some ways, I think the beauty of the animation might have gotten Elemental into the Oscars in the Best Animated Feature category. Sadly, I would not have nominated this one. I don't think it was worthy of that Oscar nomination. I would actually go with a movie that's not like a great piece of animation by any means, but I found very entertaining, a lot of fun. It was a huge blockbuster hit. The Super Mario Brothers movie I thought was a blast. I mean, my nephews begged me to go. I was like, I didn't even want to see the movie. I was like, you know what? I think I'm good on that one. And I found myself really enjoying it, and I love the animation, and I thought the voice work was pretty good, and the story was surprisingly filled with tension and emotion. The Oscars have not been kind to video game adaptations, and often for good reason, but I do think the Super Mario Brothers movie was good enough to take Elemental's place this year and Best Animated Feature at the Oscars. The number five best Oscar nomination this year was international feature, Perfect Days. So I don't know about you, but I was very happy with the international feature category at this year's Oscars. I mean, some wonderful films, Society of the Snow, the Teacher's Lounge, obviously the movie that won, The Zone of Interest. But one of my absolute favorite films I saw very close to when I finally made my top 10 list of the year, 
I spent the first two weeks of January like trying to see everything I could and Perfect Days, it never came to my town in the theater, but I did get a screener for it. And pretty much within the opening five to 10 minutes, I had already fallen in love with this movie. I mean, it's very simple, the story of a man in Tokyo who cleans public toilets, and there are long stretches of the film without dialogue, it takes its time, but as the movie goes on, it starts to work this magic on the viewer, and that beautiful and affecting lead performance by Koji Yakusho is divine. I know this film did pretty well at the Cannes Film Festival last year. I'm not really sure what happened between then and the Oscars because I do think this film should have gotten more nominations across the board. It should have been more of a contender in Best Actor this entire award season. This film by Vim Vendors is a stunner. It has so much to say about life and love and mortality and finding your happiness in the unlikeliest of places. If for some reason this wonderful movie passed you by, do yourself a favor and check out Perfect Days. Okay, and back to my worst list. I think the number four worst Oscar nomination this year was original screenplay Maestro. He's just a man, a horribly aging man who cannot just be wholly one thing. Let me start by saying I did not hate Maestro. In my review in December, I gave the film a 7.5 out of 10. I liked it. I thought the performances were pretty strong. I love the music and the cinematography. There is a lot to enjoy about Maestro, even though I don't plan to watch it again anytime soon, because I do think the main weakness of Maestro is the screenplay. I felt like it was trying to do too much and could have had more focus throughout. I mean, I give Bradley Cooper props for not completely shying away from Leonard Bernstein's bisexuality, his relationships with men. We get both Matt Bomer and Gideon Glick as his male lovers in the movie, but we never get to know them very well. They always feel like stock characters. And what Cooper is clearly most interested in is Bernstein's relationship with his wife, Felicia. So I felt like the storytelling at times was muddled. And so I can get behind some of those Oscar nominations for Maestro, obviously Best Actor and Best Actress, Best Picture, I guess, like it doesn't need to be in picture, but I'm okay with it. Obviously cinematography and makeup and sound, those make sense. But original screenplay? Original screenplay. Did we really need to give this movie that nomination? I mean, Bradley Cooper was already getting nominated for this movie in both picture and actor. And original screenplay, which he shared with Josh Singer, just felt like overkill. It didn't need to happen. Maestro could have had six Oscar nominations, not seven, because there were so many wonderful original screenplays this past year that could have been acknowledged in this category. I'm thinking of Fair Play, which would have been a really cool lone nomination for that movie. And Dream Scenario, starring Nicolas Cage, I do think that was the most underrated film of 2023. And Cage did get a Golden Globe nomination, but that movie was really not recognized much this award season. I do think a Best Original Screenplay Oscar nomination for Dream Scenario would have been awesome. But my choice in this category, what I would have replaced Maestro with is Saltburn by Emerald Fennell, who had previously won in this category in 2021 for Promising Young Woman. Now, I know I'm an outlier on Saltburn. I loved it. It was one of my three favorite films of 2023, and some of you liked it or even loved it. Some of you hated it. But at the end of the day, I do think there was enough good work in Saltburn for it to get into the Oscars somewhere. Maybe supporting actress for Rosamund Pike, maybe cinematography. I personally really love the storytelling structure of Saltburn, starting at an academic institution. We get to know the characters there for about 40-ish minutes. We set up character motivation, the mood of the film. And then we switch to the Saltburn estate 
and all of the shenanigans that happen over the next hour and a half or so. I love a filmmaker who goes for broke, and I thought Emerald Fennell put so much passion into that story and that movie. The performances are great, I love the look of it, and I do think that screenplay is very original in a lot of different ways. So yeah, at the 96 Academy Awards, I would take out Maestro in Best Original Screenplay and replace it with Saltburn. And now my number four choice for Best Oscar nomination of 2023 is Supporting Actor Mark Ruffalo, Poor Things. You're always reading now, Benna. You're losing some of your adorable way of speaking. To be honest, now that the dust has kind of settled on this past award season, one of the big question marks for me is why did Robert Downey Jr. completely sweep the season for Oppenheimer in Best Supporting Actor? He gives an excellent performance in that movie. Oppenheimer was the big awards frontrunner of the season, but I feel like we could have had one surprise win along the way at Critics' Choice or BAFTA or SAG. Somebody else could have won Best Supporting Actor, and we still could have given the Oscar to Robert Downey Jr. in the end. I mean, I do think Ryan Gosling, for most people, was the likely second choice for Barbie. At the beginning of the season, I thought he could win something at Golden Globes or maybe even SAG, but as Robert Downey Jr. kept sweeping from one show to the next, once he won at SAG, it was over. You know, it was like, okay, this guy is just going to win the Oscar and nobody could really compete with him. And although I was very pleased Davine Joy Randolph swept in Best Supporting Actress, I think that was deserved for her wonderful performance in The Holdovers, I didn't think Robert Downey Jr. was so monumentally incredible in Oppenheimer that he necessarily had to win everywhere. And for me, all season long, going back to seeing this film at the Telluride Film Festival in early September, for me, I think the best performance in supporting actor all season was Mark Ruffalo in Poor Things. What a dynamite against type comedic performance that was. I mean, you totally forgot you were watching Mark Ruffalo after a while, and he just became that skeezy character in all of his glory. He was an amazing foil for Emma Stone to play off of. It just felt like Mark Ruffalo was able to surprise us again in Poor Things. He went all in on that character and he could have crashed and burned, but he didn't. He is an absolute delight in that movie. And for a while there, I wasn't even sure if he was going to get the Oscar nomination. I mean, he did not get in at BAFTA. He did not get in at SAG. And I was like, okay, I, I don't care what happens in this category. Mark Ruffalo deserves that Oscar nomination. At least get him in. I'm so happy he showed up on Oscar nominations morning. I mean, as I said, after BAFTA and SAG, it was over. Mark Ruffalo was not winning anything. But like Robert Downey Jr., he was overdue too. Ruffalo has now had four Oscar nominations in Best Supporting Actor without a win. I'm hoping he will be more competitive on his fifth time around. I think even at the very beginning of award season, maybe even going back to July, we all kind of knew Robert Downey Jr. was going to win the Oscar in this category. But if they had called Mark Ruffalo's name instead, I would have gone completely berserk because he would have deserved it. This is easily one of the year's best Oscar nominations. Okay, the number three worst Oscar nomination of the year is original score, John Williams, Indiana Jones, and the Dial of Destiny. Get back. So at the end of the day, this one makes my list because Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny did not need to get any Oscar nominations. The movie was fine. I might have even liked it better than some. I thought it went into some interesting places in that third act. But even though I adore John Williams, of course I adore this man and his incredible body of work going back many decades, there hasn't been much of his work, I would say, in the last decade 
that really needed to get Oscar nominations. I mean, what, maybe Lincoln in 2012 was the last score he produced I found to be Oscar worthy. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, I listened to some of the score while I was getting ready for my Oscar predictions video on the score category. And it just felt kind of familiar, like themes we've heard in the previous four Indiana Jones films. And I know he's a legend. I mean, he scores a movie these days, and he's going to get an Oscar nomination. I mean, he got nominated for Rise of Skywalker. Like, Rise of Skywalker got John Williams an Oscar nomination. And I was like, okay. His nomination for Dial of Destiny has nothing to do, I think, with the quality of the work. It's a name check. It's a, uh, oh, John Williams, check. Everybody voting, John Williams, put him in. And we had so many wonderful scores in 2023. It felt wrong to give a slot to this movie. I don't think John Williams even attended the Oscars this year. He even knew, I've got no chance on this one. We could have gone with The Boy and the Heron or The Holdovers or The Zone of Interest or Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Like any of those would have been a much better original score nomination, but my choice in this category, what would I replace Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny with? It would be for a film that did not even make the shortlist. Like how did this memorable emotional score not make the shortlist? It is a mystery to me the score to Past Lives by Christopher Bear and Daniel Rawson. I held off for a long while, but two nights after the Oscars, I finally watched Past Lives for a second time. I found it even more moving on my second viewing, and that score I find to be so subtle and beautiful. Nora's final long walk back to her apartment steps. The score in that moment is just absolutely brilliant and it makes that lovely final scene so devastating and heartbreaking i don't know what happened there this score should have at least made the shortlist and i would have gone even further by replacing john williams score to indiana jones and the dial of destiny with the score to past lives the number three best oscar nomination of 2023 is actor Paul Giamatti, The Holdovers. But he broke three ribs, which was technically his fault because he shouldn't have been in the road. Two dollars, please. Also, he shat himself, which was the greater indignity. <laughs> so the best actor category this year was pretty great. I mean, I think the only person some could have issue with is Bradley Cooper in Maestro. But I don't hate that nomination, that's fine. I mean, he is very good in the movie. You have Coleman Domingo in Rustin, he was fantastic. And Jeffrey Wright in American Fiction, another terrific performance. I'm so happy he won Best Leading Performance at the Film Independent Spirit Awards. Obviously, most of us are very happy Killian Murphy went on to win Best Actor at the Oscars for Oppenheimer. But I do think one of the best performances of 2023 that did get the nomination, but not the win at the Oscars, is Paul Giamatti for his hilarious and engaging and at times emotionally devastating performance in The Holdovers. I have loved this actor going back to the 90s. He deserved to get an Oscar nomination for Sideways, another Alexander Payne movie. His only nomination before The Holdovers was way back in 2006 for Cinderella Man. And this guy is way too good to only have two Oscar nominations on his resume. At the beginning of the award season, it looked like Best Actor was going to be a race between Killian Murphy and Paul Giamatti, both won at the Golden Globes, and then Paul Giamatti beat Killian Murphy at Critics' Choice. And for the longest time, I was thinking, okay, Murphy will win at BAFTA, and then Giamatti will win at SAG. And then I felt like this will be a very unpredictable race all the way to Oscar nights. But when Murphy won at SAG, it was over. Giamatti needed to win there to stay competitive. And then Murphy, as expected, went on to win at the Oscars. Rightfully so. But I do think an Oscar victory for Paul Giamatti would have also been an all-timer would have also been fantastic. I don't think that would have been a bad win in any way. 
Paul Giamatti should have an Oscar by now. He was so perfectly cast in The Holdovers, I can't imagine anyone else in that role. And so while I am very excited for Killian Murphy, that is a great win as well. There is a small part of me that wishes Paul Giamatti could have been a bit more competitive, could have maybe won at SAG or something. That is such a beautiful character, memorably played by the great Paul Giamatti, one of the best Oscar nominations of this past year easily. All right, my choice for the number two worst Oscar nomination of 2023 is original song, The Fire Inside from Flame and Hot. What? You need a Cholo translator? All right, I got you. So, sales are down. I am so sick of this yearly Oscar nomination for Diane Warren for a song that may or may not be good, maybe it's okay, maybe it's terrible, it doesn't seem to even matter anymore. All it seems to come down to is, did Diane Warren write a song for a movie this year? Oh, she did! Nominate her! It doesn't matter what the song is or what the movie is, it's like when voters just see her name on a list, they check her off, and I'm sick of it. It's like, let's give her an Oscar nomination for a banger song in a great film that's maybe getting nominations in other categories, and let's finally get Diane Warren an Oscar victory. This was, I think, her 15th Oscar nomination for Flame and Hot. I almost feel like she has enemies in the Academy because it's like this running joke. Let's just nominate Diane Warren for everything. And it's like this woman is going to die with 37 Oscar nominations and no wins. It's like, what is going on here? And what continues to make it such a joke is that she keeps getting nominated for movies that like nobody's heard of. I mean, honestly, I had not heard of Flame and Hot until Oscar nominations morning. I was like, what? What is this film? It went to Hulu like earlier in the year and it's a biopic. And I did watch it. I try to watch pretty much everything that gets nominated at the Oscars. And it's the most average movie ever made. But she got the Oscar nomination anyway. And so here we are near the end of March 2024. And I'm already thinking, I'm like, okay, so what mediocre movie that nobody's heard of is Diane Warren going to get an Oscar nomination for next year? Because it's probably happening and I will be back here in a year talking about how that song nomination is one of the worst of the 97th Academy Awards, and so on and so on. Now, I will say I did not pick this as the number one worst Oscar nomination of the year, because to be honest, I do think the song The Fire Inside is a little better than the song she was nominated for last year. I mean, I'm not going to be playing it over and over, but like the song itself is okay. I am just totally sick of this charade nominating Diane Warren year after year. She always looks painfully unhappy when she loses again. I mean, she just lost to Billie Eilish, a 22 year old Billie Eilish for the second time in a couple of years, and apparently Warren threw a fit at this year's ceremony when they didn't say her name before they opened the envelope for best original song. I'm just like, I am over this drama. Let's have five years without a Diane Warren nomination. Five years, and then she gets to come back with a great song and a fantastic movie, and let's finally get her an Academy Award. How does that sound? There were much better contenders to get into this category, like either of the two songs from The Color Purple. Dance the Night from Barbie should have been nominated, but the Academy has this rule now where only two songs from the same movie can get nominated. And because Barbie already had I'm Just Ken and What Was I Made For, they couldn't nominate Dance the Night. But that is a banger song and that should be here too. However, my choice in this category to replace The Fire Inside from Flame and Hot is Meet in the Middle from Flora and Son. This was another vastly underrated 2023 movie I saw way back at the Sundance Film Festival. I really dug this film. It's not perfect. 
It's got some narrative lulls here and there, but the songs are amazing and Meet in the Middle is probably my favorite song from the movie. It's such a wonderful scene. It's kind of the heart of the entire movie. And I kind of wish Flora and Son had gotten an Oscar nomination for something. This was the category it had its best shots. So in best original song, I would take out the fire inside and replace it with meat in the middle. And now the number two best Oscar nomination of 2023 is easily, I would say, actress Sandra Huller, Anatomy of a Fall. Because your pride makes your head explode before you can even come up with the little sham of an idea. And now you wake up and you're 40 and you need someone to blame. And you're the one to blame. What an absolutely spellbinding, breathtaking turn Sandra Huller gave us with Anatomy of a Fall. I was extremely tired, but for two and a half hours, Sandra Huller kept me upright and engaged from one minute to the next. I was like, who the hell is this woman? How have I not seen her before in a movie? She is so incredible when she's fiery in that argument scene, one of the most famous scenes from the movie, but also in her quiet moments, just from an expression, a look she'll give in the courtroom. It was such a masterful performance, so much so, I thought she could have beaten Emma Stone at BAFTA for Best Actress, I almost predicted it, and at the Oscars, I would have her in number two. I know many of you would have Lily Gladstone in number two for Killers of the Flower Moon. That's also a very good performance. I just had some issues with Killers of the Flower Moon as a movie, whereas Anatomy of a Fall, I thought was a masterpiece and is easily one of the 10 best films of 2023. I can't wait to watch it again. Sandra Huller, of course, had a banner year with not only Anatomy of a Fall, but also The Zone of Interest. She is clearly a talent to watch. What an extraordinary performance she gave in Anatomy of a Fall. All right, and finally, what do I think was the absolute worst Oscar nomination of 2023? I didn't have to think too long about this one. My number one choice for the worst nomination at the 96 Academy Awards is Makeup Golda. My father's face, Henry. I will never forget that look. I am not that little girl hiding in the cellar. So to be honest, the most difficult Oscar-nominated movie for me to get through this past award season was Golda, starring Helen Mirren. This film in every way was a slog. It was so bad. The performances were only so-so. It's narratively dull and unsurprising. And I just felt kind of icky watching Mirren try to act try to create a character behind all of that latex and prosthetics. It was very strange because it doesn't look like Helen Mirren, but I never once forgot I was watching Mirren. Like she doesn't disappear into that role in a way a lot of actors often do when they don't look anything like themselves. And the makeup itself looked kind of rubbery. It looked okay in scenes. And then other scenes, it kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. And at the end of the day, it just didn't work very well. And for that makeup, that sort of mediocre makeup on Helen Mirren to make Golda an Oscar nominated movie till the end of time, it just, it doesn't sit well with me. This nomination did not need to happen. This makeup could have made the short list, I guess, okay, but it should not have gotten into the Oscars. I would rather have something like Bo is Afraid been Oscar nominated for makeup. That would have been really cool. But my choice in this category to replace Golda is the makeup in The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Not necessarily because the makeup job in that movie is like the best of the year, but if you've been following my channel for a while, you know I adore the horror genre, and I feel like in recent years, it's become more and more difficult for a genre film to break into the Oscars even in the technical categories. And as I'm going to talk about in an upcoming video all about horror and makeup at the Oscars, like in the 1980s, typically this category could go to a genre movie, like An American Werewolf in London 
and The Fly, which are two of my favorite ever wins in the makeup category. And so I do think the makeup in The Last Voyage of the Demeter is very good and Oscar worthy, and it would have given the horror genre some kind of nomination at the 96th Academy Awards. So in the best makeup category at this year's Oscars, I would easily, as fast as I possibly could, take out Golda and replace it with The Last Voyage of the Demeter. And finally, I don't think there's going to be much suspense as to what I chose for the number one best Oscar nomination of 2023. It is, of course, Best Picture, Past Lives. As most of you know, my favorite film of 2023 is Past Lives, written and directed by Celine Song. I just think it is one of the most beautiful examinations of a decades-long relationship between two people I have seen since the Before Trilogy by Richard Linklater, right from that remarkable opening shot. The performances, the cinematography, the score, like I talked about earlier, it's all magnificent in every way. There is nothing I would change about this amazing movie. As I said, I just watched it for a second time a few nights ago, and I cried even harder on the second viewing than I did at the first viewing way back at Sundance 2023. Past Lives is a very special movie to me. I am so happy it got into the Oscars at all. I mean, for a few months, I was like, maybe the Oscars will overlook it completely. I was pretty confident it could get into original screenplay. But other than that, I was like, as much as I would love for it to get into Best Actor and Best Actress and Best Supporting Actor and Cinematography and Score, like I would have given Past Lives at least seven Oscar nominations. I don't think Best Picture was ever guaranteed, so on Oscar nominations morning, when this wonderful movie not only got into original screenplay, but also Best Picture, one of the all-timer lineups we've had in a while for Best Picture, I was so thrilled. I knew it was never going to win. This was the year of Oppenheimer. But as an Oscar enthusiast, I am so thrilled that for the rest of time, Past Lives will always be an Oscar nominee for Best Picture. I love that. I think more and more people, not just now, but for many years to come, will discover Past Lives because of this nomination. And that is great. The more people down the road who watch Past Lives, the better. And so, yeah, there was no question for me here. The number one best nomination at the 96 Academy Awards is Best Picture, Past Lives. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and let me know in the comments below what are your picks for the five best and the five worst Oscar nominations of 2023, and we'll see you next time at the Awards Contender.